on a crisp, clear morning in the middle of a war that would eventually claim over 15 million lives. About 100,000 soldiers are believed to have participated in an unprecedented, unsanctioned, unofficial truce. Some of the specifics remain a bit unclear, but most accounts say that the truce began with soldiers singing Christmas carols, songs that were near and dear to them, and songs that some on the other side knew as well. Private Albert Morin of the Second Queen's Regiment described the evening as a beautiful moonlit night, frost on the ground, white almost everywhere. Grand Williams, Graham Williams of the 5th London Brigade, uh, Rifle Brigade, described the magic that took place that Christmas Eve in 1914 by saying this, first the Germans would sing one of their carols, and then we would sing one of ours, until we all started up, O come all ye faithful. The Germans immediately joined in singing the same hymn in the Latin words, Adeste Fidelis. And I thought, well, this is really a most extraordinary thing. Two nations both singing the same carol in the middle of a war. But that was not the most extraordinary thing. Listen to what happened next. The next morning, in some places, German soldiers emerged from their trenches calling out Merry Christmas in English. Allied soldiers came out warily to greet them. In other parts of the Western Front, German soldiers held up signs saying, You no shoot, we no shoot. <laughs> Over the course of the day, troops exchanged gifts of cigarettes, food, buttons, and hats. The Christmas truce also allowed both sides to finally bury their dead comrades whose bodies had lain for weeks on no man's land the ground between the opposing trenches. The impromptu ceasefire truce looked different up and down the Western Front. Here's, here's something that I found on this. This was from an, an article uh, from Time Magazine um, dated uh, the 24th of, of December 2014. One account mentions a British soldier having his hair cut by his pre-war German barber. I'm not sure I'd want a straight edge in the hand of my enemy. Another talks of a pig roast. Several mentioned impromptu kickabouts with makeshift soccer balls. Now, there was some, some in some of the things that I read about an organized game, but, but history doesn't really bear that out. But they did do something to put something of a soccer ball together so they could kick, kick it about just a little bit. But the thing that struck me was this truce began with music. Music and, and one, of the, one of the songs, most powerful songs from the, the 60s, reminded everybody that music is a, is a universal language and love is the key, right? Music is something that we can all relate to. Think about it. You can hear just the first couple notes of a song and it will transform you back to your wedding day. It will transform you back to the time when you lost some money. It'll transform you back to that time when your heart was crushed by your first breakup or your first girlfriend or boyfriend. Music is an incredible, incredible tool that God has given us that can bridge gaps for all of us. How many people are here and English is not your first language? English is not your first language. It's okay. Let's see if we can sing this song together. You ready? You sing it in your language. Ready? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now I'm found Was blind But now I see Music. Now, music is so important and significant to each of us because that's how God wired us up. 
but he doesn't just want us to revel in songs. He wants us to learn something from his chosen people, Israel. The book of Psalms are their prayers put to music. The book of Psalms are God's songs that his people sang to him and to one another to encourage themselves in him and learning more and more about who God is and what he has done. But the thing about Israel was Israel did not believe that their relationship with God was supposed to be something they just did on Saturday or the Sabbath. They knew that God was interested in every single moment of their lives, every single day of the week, every week of the month, every month of the year, every year of their lives. And so whatever they were going through, they would write their prayers and put them to music to share them with one another. Whether they were sad, whether they were in need, whether they were happy, or maybe they were terrified and they had nowhere else to turn, when their bellies were full and their hearts were joyful, when their bellies were growling and they had need. They wrote their prayer songs of love, of desperation, of pain and contentment because they knew God cared. They knew God was involved with every single part of their day. Not only did he know what was going to happen, but he wanted to be for them to know he was right there with them, walking through every single thing. A lot of times as, as New Testament disciples of Jesus, we don't pay a whole lot of attention to the Old Testament, and that's to our detriment. This is one of the most significant books in all of the Bible. Because if you want to know what God cares about, read the Psalms. God cares when your heart is broken. God cares when there's a battle you're facing and you are outnumbered. God cares when you are joyful, when he's poured a blessing into your life and you want to say thank you. God cares about you. He cares about every single moment of your day. That's really the reason we start with 40 days of prayer. It's not because God needs to hear from us. It's because we need to be reminded that God's there. And he wants to be involved in every single moment of your day. If you haven't signed up yet for 40 days of prayer, please, in your worship folder, you can go on, click the link. It'll take you 10 seconds. 10 seconds. In there it says, takes you less than 30 seconds. Well, I timed it when I did it. it. Took me 10 seconds. It's simple. You can do this. And you will get a reminder every single day. And, and this is not about you giving money to the church. It's not about anything like that. It is about us connecting with God because you know what? We as a congregation will not be strong for God's kingdom unless you and me as individual followers of Jesus are strong for God's kingdom. And we won't be strong for God's kingdom unless we are connecting with God every single day. Spending time in his word, spending time in prayer, spending time with other believers, telling them the things that God's been doing in your life, the things that you've seen in the lives of others, the way he's working in our church. He cares for you and he wants you to know that you are of ultimate value to him. We're going to spend our time in Psalm 113, the, the passage that we read uh, as we kind of prepared our hearts for communion. Now, the Psalm 113 is, is called the, the Hillel. It's, it's part of a group of psalms called the Hillel, from Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. And during the three major feast times of, of Israel, they would sing the Hillel. Now, when it was Passover, and Jesus and his disciples probably did this, they sang the first two psalms, Psalm 113, Psalm 114, and then after Passover, they sang Psalm 115 to Psalm 118, and it's called the Hallel because the way each of them uh, focuses on, on praising God, but especially Psalm 113, the word hallelujah is literally praise Yah, Yah is just shortened for Yahweh. Now, I thought it was interesting 
it, when we read it in English, we kind of miss some of the things that, that would be really just in the face of the, the Israelite. They were very careful in how they referred to God. They, they were told in the, in the Ten Commandments, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And so the most pious among them decided that if we're not supposed to take his name in vain, we won't say his name at all. So instead of saying Yahweh, wherever they read Yahweh, they would say Adonai. And when you, when you look in our, our English translations, you see uh, all capitals, L-O-R-D, that's, that's Yahweh. Okay, so uh, they, they just were very careful about this. So listen to how the, the Lexham English Bible draws out the, the very literal translation of this. It says, praise Yah. Praise, O servants of Yahweh. Praise the name of Yahweh. Let the name of Yahweh be blessed from now until forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting, let the name of Yahweh be blessed. Yahweh is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like Yahweh our God? Who is enthroned on high? Who do you think Psalm 113 is about? It's about Yahweh. And, and it's about us knowing that he is there and he cares. And in Psalm 113, he gives three very definitive, very distinctive answers to the simple question, why everyone should praise Yahweh. Now you're thinking to yourself, okay, everyone, that's a big word. Everyone means everyone. If you're a follower of Jesus, you should praise Yahweh. If you're not a follower of Jesus, guess what? Your life is going to praise Yahweh one way or the other. He is worthy of the praise of every single human being who draws breath, whose heart beats. Three simple reasons why everyone should praise Yahweh. First of all, because his name is the greatest. His name is the greatest. A.W. Tozer reveals all of us when he points something really significant out here. He says, what comes to, into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Every single one of us think something about God and whatever your thoughts are about him says something about you we begin with God because he gives us perspective he is to be the center not us we do not begin with man or woman with humankind we don't begin with us because when we do everything gets skewed when we are the center, we have to be soft on sin because sin is our native language. It's the, it's the sea in which we swim. So we begin with God because he has an answer for sin. If we begin with us, then sin shrinks God down and puffs us up. And so this psalm will begin with God, focusing our attention on him, when we think rightly about God, then we will be able to pray rightly because we will be amazed that such a God wants to have relationship with us. Think about that. As Tim started us off in talking about God being incomprehensible, unapproachable, that's the one who wants to know us. Watchman Nee made a, a really profound statement that, that you have to think about for a second to catch. He said, the more we know God, the more we will pray. The more we pray, the less we will pray, and the more we will praise. Think about that. The more you know about God, the more you will pray. And the more you pray, the less you will pray, and the more you will praise. Does your prayer time move you to praise? Is your prayer time just about what you need, what you want? I have to say, as I'm standing up here saying these words, I'm convicted about my prayer time. 
I don't know about you. Connie and I concluded our day last night with praying. And, and I have to say, I said amen without really praising God because I wasn't focused on Him. I was focused on what I want, focused on me. When I'm the center, things get all skewed. Praise Yahweh because His name is the greatest. This prayer, as we already said, begins with hallelujah or praise Yah. Verse 1, we read this. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. God's servants are to praise Him. Now, clearly, the servants would be those who are, say, who are, are, are there to serve God, to, to minister to God, for God, with God. But every single person on the face of this earth does the bidding of God. Every single person is a servant of God, whether they choose to be or not. Everyone praises God. Verse 2 reads this way. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. I will bless him now and forever. What do you think of when you think of blessing somebody? Well, we think of giving them something. We think of doing something for them. What does God need for us to give to him? What does, well, let me ask it this way. What does God lack that you have to give him? Nothing. What do you give a God who has everything? What he's asking for, what he's saying, is the only thing you can give him is to praise him. Do you want to praise him? Do you want to bless him? We bless him by praising him. We praise him by acknowledging him for who he is and what he's done. As we go throughout each day, when we talk about who God is and what he's done in our lives, we're praising him and we're blessing him. A.W. Tozer, again, has a really great insight I wanted to share here. Always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God, just as her most significant message is what she says about him or leaves unsaid. For her silence is often more eloquent than her speech. She can never escape the self-disclosure of her witness concerning God. What do you say about God in the course of your day? What do you leave unsaid? Do you want to bless God? Then talk about Him. Tell everyone what you've seen Him do in your life. How you've seen Him work in the midst of our church. And if you're not seeing a lot of that, then guess what? That's what the 40 days of prayer is about. Tell other people and you will be blessing God. Why do we need to do this? Because God is worthy of everyone's praise 24-7. Look at verse 3. Verse 3. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Think about the throne room of God. Of all the things that are happening there, we know that angels come and go. We know there's some things that happen there just from passages we've read like in Isaiah 14 um, or Job chapter 1. Another thing that we know is that there are angels who fly around and they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We know that they say that. Now, we don't know that they say it every second. We just know that the way, the way we read about it, they do it on a continual basis. And is it because God, his ego needs to be stroked? No. It blesses us to bless him. Because when we are the center, guess what? The world gets askew. When he is the center, everything is made right. He's the one who made us, not we ourselves, the psalm tells us. And so we honor him. We praise him. We, we give all adoration, glory, and praise by blessing him. 
by giving it all back to him. Praise him today, tomorrow, and forever. Each of those three first three verses tell us that we are to praise God's name. Now, a name is not just a convenient tag by which we can refer to him. His name is his, speaks of his character. And, and the, 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 the name that he's known in Psalm 113 by Yahweh is the covenant-keeping name. It's the name that he gave Moses to tell his people of. He wanted them to know that, that he was there for them. And so if you break that name, Yahweh, down into its um, most basic form, basically you can translate it, I am who I am. Or I will be who I will be. I am all of that. I'm everything. I'm the first and the last. I'm, I'm everything. I'm everything you'll ever need. I'm everything you will ever need. I am the eternally existent one. And the God who is transcendent, infinite, and unknowable has revealed himself to us by how he acts, by how he behaves. We praise him because his name is the greatest and because his throne is is the highest. Look at verse 4. Praise God because his throne is the highest. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. He is sovereign over every nation on the face of the earth. Think about this. There are 7.5 billion, with a B, people covering the face of the earth and God is sovereign over all of them. Combine all the people, all the technology, all the military might of every nation on the face of the earth, and God is greater. Anybody have an amen out there for that? Amen. Yeah. 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 He is greater. Look at verse 5. Who is like the Lord our God who is seated on high? No one. There is no comparison. His throne is above everything and every one. Verse 6, we read this. Who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He's talking about God. Who's like our God who's thrown his way above and he looks down on the heavens and the earth? So here's the point. To look down on the earth and to look even down to, to be able to see the heavens, God has to look down. But what a curious thing. This awesome, awesome, awe-inspiring God, he's the greatest, his throne is the strongest, but we praise Yahweh because his kindness is the greatest. His love is the, is the sorry, his love is the kindest. His love beats all other loves because he's so far above us. He's so far out of our reach that if he did not reveal himself to us, we could never know him. We could never come into relationship with him. Look at verse 7. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He doesn't just look down from heaven, wringing his hands at what a mess we've made of our lives and of his beautiful creation. He came down and willingly extended his hand, kneeling down beside us, reaching in to the refuse in which we were surrounded, cleaning it all off and wrapping us in his arms. He reaches out to the destitute, to the desperate, to the lost, to the sick, and he brings us back in to life with him. Now, the picture we have here is of poor folks who try to warm themselves at the dump. The reason they try to warm themselves at the dump is because, first of all, it's a source of food. And there's always something burning there, so there's always a source of heat. And God doesn't come to the clean, pristine cities he goes to the dump and he reaches down. He reached down into my life when I was 14. I had nothing to give anybody. 
my mind and my life was just going the wrong direction. And God came in and reached me right where I, right where I was, warming myself in the dump. He did the same to you as well. When we remember that, then it helps us have this, this, this revelation of God's awe-inspiring love because his love is the kindest. The exalted sovereign over all God condescends to share his nature with man, exalting the lowly and the poor to places of prominence and prosperity. Look at verse 8. To make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. When he bestows on us the honor of royalty, he reveals our high value the way he values us, the way he cares about us, the way he wants us to know who we are. He left everything so that we could know him. He is kind by exalting even the lowliest of all people. And then he gives us another really practical example. Verse nine, we read this. He gives the barren woman a home, making her a joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. He blesses the childless, childless woman with children, providing a home and filling her with joy. We can only know God because he chose to reveal himself to us. And though we can know him, we cannot and will not fully understand him because God is transcendent. He is infinite and he's unknowable unless God chooses to reveal himself to us. And during these next 40 days together, I want to invite you to join me on this journey. I'm going to be spending time every single day pouring over these passages, seeking God's face, inviting him to, 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 to show me who I am. I don't know about you, but I struggle with the mirror. I struggle. Sometimes when I get up in the morning and I, I look in the mirror, I do not like what I see. Tuck it in and walk around a little more upright. But what God has been convicting me of is I need to stop worrying about what's in that mirror. Instead, I need to be concerned about what's in this mirror. This reflects who I really am. This reflects who you really are. Because it tells us all about him. And he tells us that we're valuable. He tells us that we're lovely. He tells us that we are good. He tells us that we are the apple of his eye. What he cares about you matters more than what anyone in this world thinks about you. And this will give us an opportunity to spend that time finding out more, maybe being reminded of what he thinks of us. Now there are some who will choose not to participate in this and, and, and that's okay. Um, if, you, if you've already got things that you're doing or, or whatever, I, I would encourage you to reconsider and, and join us in this because this could be something that, that God would use in each of our lives to help us become more aware of who he is. If you're out there and you're thinking to yourself, you know, I'm not even sure this God is real. Join us. Give it a try. Don't even have to tell anybody. Just sign up for this. You'll get the emails and you can look at those passages and here's what I would encourage you to do. God, if you're real, show me. If you're out there and you care about me, show me. I'm here. I'm listening. Everyone can be involved in this. There are some that chose not to participate in the Christmas Eve truce of 1914. Um, Here's one of the pieces that I read. Evidence suggests that in many places firing continued, and in at least two places a truce was attempted, but soldiers attempting to fraternize were shot by opposing forces. Some people just are not interested in peace. For some, the Christmas Eve truce was not an example of chivalry in the depths of war, but rather of, subver of subversion. One notable objection came from a corporal in the 16th Bavarians who said, Such a thing should not happen in wartime. Have you no German sense of honor? Wonder who said that? Go ahead and hit the next slide. 
There we go. Will you join the chorus praising God? If you were to write a song, what would you call it? What would its title be? If you were to write a song, and, and I'm talking about a song about God or to God, if you were to write that song, what would you call it? And what would the words be? And you have examples, 150 examples in the Psalms. And you've got different songs throughout the Old and New Testament as well. Uh, we looked at one of them is, uh, just over Christmas as Mary wrote one as well. Maybe you think to yourself, you know, I don't, I don't sing. I don't play an instrument. I, I'm not musical at all. That's okay. I have a challenge for each one of us. My challenge is this. Ask God to help you hear the song he's composing in your heart. There's something that he's been writing on your heart. And it may not be melodic. It may not rhyme. But it's something he's been teaching you. Something he wants to pour through you. And we all need to benefit from it. So I want to challenge every single person here to consider writing a song. I know this is really kind of weird. You didn't come to church thinking, I'm going to get a music class. I would not be the one to give it to you. But uh, look at this, this slide here. There's a, we have a Facebook page. And honestly, we have not paid a lot, of, a, great, a lot of great attention to the Facebook page. And we're going to start this year. That's one of my goals for 2019. But on the bottom there, it says www.facebook.com forward slash first bat. Now, in your worship folder on the back cover where you can take notes, uh, on the very bottom, that, that web page is there for you. That uh, uh, link is there for you. So you'll, you'll, you'll be able to do this. You'll, you'll see that, that uh, you'll go on there and you'll see, yeah, Len is not a, a songwriter because my song's on there already. Um, and uh, someone else followed up on that and, and they put a song in there as well. They're a better songwriter than me, so you have to go find out who that is. But I just want to challenge you to share your song of praise to God. Let's, let's, let's take God at his word. You know, he, he, the Psalms tell us that he inhabits the praises of his people. Let's, let's let him know that we love him. Let's, let's show the world that we love him. Let's, let's willingly share the things that he has poured into each and every one of our lives. So before your head hits the pillow this evening, begin to ask God to compose his song in your heart and mind. And then sometime this week, write your song. Go to that Facebook page. Write your song on there. Now, maybe, maybe you're like, gosh, you know, I got all kinds of songs. Well, if you got four or five, put them on there. Do them one at a time. Give someone else an opportunity to jump on there. But let's do that together. And let's, let's invite God to just fill us with his love. Because he is worthy of everything. He's put a song in your heart. And let's share that song. Now, you don't have to just share it on Facebook. You want to bless God? This week, tell someone something God did for you. You want to take a risk? Tell someone who doesn't believe in Jesus. Tell someone who, who maybe you're not sure if they do or not. Just say, you know what? Can I tell you what God did for me? Just tell them the story. Tell them the story. And that will bless God. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for wanting us to bless you, for wanting to hear from us, from, for, for willingly getting involved in each and every one of our lives, for composing the songs that our lives can sing. Give us the courage that we will need to do that this year. In Jesus' name, amen.